You're listening to the Place Northwest podcast, your digital resource for the latest insight and analysis on all things property in the northwest of England. Hello and welcome to the Place Northwest podcast. I'm Sarah Townsend, editor of Place Northwest. For this episode, I'm joined by Felicity Tullock, head of licensing at Kite Solicitors, and Chris Middleton, commercial manager at Developer Bruntwood, to discuss licenses in principle. This episode is brought to you in association with Kites Solicitors. Kites is an award-winning independent law firm based in Manchester City Centre. The firm has an extensive property department whose clients include big name developers, construction, landlord and tenant and planning clients. Kites also has a specialist licensing team with a wide range of expertise. The licensing team advises property clients on innovative solutions such as licenses in principle and shadow licenses. Today, we're going to be discussing licenses in principle. This is a legal tool gradually being recognised by developers and landlords as a way of mitigating uncertainty around how buildings are going to be occupied. Okay, kicking off. um, Felicity, do you want to um, share with us sort of what exactly are licenses in principle and in a nutshell, how do they help developers and councils? Yes, I mean, license in principle is is just a premises license. Um, it's applied for in the same way with the same sort of information that an operator would use when they apply for a license. But it's more commonly used by developers or landlords to license units that have yet to have found um, an end user or a tenant. Um, so we found um, that they've become quite a useful tool for developers to license space um, in readiness for those tenants by giving some certainty um, to both parties. And it often means that the conditionality around a deal can be removed because those operators coming in to a particular unit um, can do so safe in the knowledge that there's already a license in place. Okay, great. Okay. And how does this sort of differ from what was used in recent years? Was this this, this tool not around previously? Or is it just that it's been sort of slow to be adopted? The Licensing Act 2003, when it came in in 2005, uh, made provision for what was known as a provisional statement, um, which was designed uh, for use by developers rather than operators. And it was a similar process to obtaining a premises license, but not in not as much detail needed to be provided when an application was made. It sort of set a precedent um, and tested the water for whether or not a particular unit could get a premises license. But they never really took off. And I think that was because even if a provisional statement was granted, an operator would still need to then come in and apply for a premises license as well. All the provisional statement did was mean that anyone who could have objected at the provisional statement stage um, and didn't, couldn't then come in and object when a premises license application was made. But often we found on the rare occasions that those provisional statements were applied for, they weren't turned into premises licenses um, quickly enough. And the longer the time that elapses between the grant of a provisional statement and then the application for a premises license devalues the, the existence of the provisional statement. So what we've done over the last couple of years um, most specifically in Manchester, but elsewhere in the country, um, is convince local authorities that developers can apply for premises licences rather than um, just operators. And we've had a great deal of success doing that. And as I've said, it it helps those uh, developers um, give certainty to their um, their site and their unit. It also gives that certainty to eventual tenants, but it also gives local authorities, I think, um, a way of shaping um, certain parts of the city. And um, we have done that for Bruntwood um, in recent years, and it enables uh, more stakeholders to get involved at an earlier stage and um, sort of develop a, an area in a more um, holistic fashion. 
Okay, absolutely. So I can see how, I can see from what you've said, how that really just relates into the plan making, you know, early plan making and um, early sort of planning process for, for you know, town centre schemes. And that can be really, really helpful. Well, let's let's hear from the developer then. Um, so um, Kites has worked with, with Bruntwood on these tools and sort of how to actually sort of obtain this license in principle. Um, Chris, can you share a few examples of where you've used this tool and sort of why you chose them as opposed to any more retrospective licensing strategy? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, we've got plenty of examples where we've used licenses in principle. Um, and I think the benefits are wide ranging. They can vary from, you know, each circumstance. But in every instance, we definitely prefer it to to a retrospective approach for for some of the reasons for this is already outlined. Um, I think somewhere like Circle Square, where you've got the whole master plan or or estate to consider, um, then the licensing strategy actually underpins the letting and customer mix strategy, because ultimately the aim is to ensure the right mix of amenity across the site, which means you know you're blending retail uses, leisure, and I suppose particularly pertinent to this discussion is um, late night entertainment. Um, and our approach to licensing at Circle Square, I suppose it was one that afforded us a bit of flexibility because obviously you can't be completely sure in advance where every single end user is going to be. Um, but then we also did have some specifics and, and, and showed some clear forward planning. Um, so we honed in on where we wanted to see the late night licenses, you know, so venues that may potentially trade up until till 4 a.m. Um, and we took advice from Kites on that as to where we thought we might be you know, most likely to, to, to be successful in getting them. Um, and that, you know, ultimately guided the the letting strategy across the estate because we had a clear, clear brief as to where those, those uses could go. Um, and then everything around that was uh, just a more sort of standard approach for where we thought the restaurants and bars would go. But we did retain flexibility by trying to get as many licenses in principle as possible. Um, I suppose on a, a, a different example, it's somewhere like Hatch, the uh, our pop-up retail destination, which is obviously just next door to, to Circle Square. Um, that was about supporting a quick turnaround for for our customers, and we were, you know, it doesn't take quite as long to fit out a shipping container as it does a, a whole sort of retail unit, and so we and those customers were sort of up against a tight deadline to try and get get the second phase of the scheme open quickly. And I think if you leave something like premises licensing to be an afterthought, then you could potentially end up in a situation where we're all ready to open uh, and then you actually don't have permission to, to serve alcohol. Mm, okay, yeah, that's a really, really good point, isn't it? So this this has kind of really enabled, well, the developer um, and the council um, as the sort of planning authority, but, you know, to have a lot more sort of, well, control, like, I guess is, is, is one way, is it's control and certainty. But I wonder, how do the... How do the how have the occupiers um, and the actual operators sort of responded to this? Are they generally happy that there's already a license in principle? They just don't have to do the work themselves. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, whether it's a new business starting out or someone taking their third or fourth site, it, the the principle is the same. Um, I think you've got so many things to consider when you're opening up a new bar or restaurant. It could be planning permission for the fit out, building control approval, negotiating the leases, and then actually getting on site and building the thing. I think. As a developer, if you can take away as much of the stress, or as Felicity said earlier, the conditionality around getting that over the line, then um, it's definitely a positive. It's just it, it's one less thing to worry about for, for both parties, really. I think it's um, it, yeah, it removes that uncertainty, and it's always, of course, an option for any end user or any tenant or operator to to amend the license once they've got it. Um, it can always be tweaked hours can be increased the layout can be changed but like chris chris says to have that sort of basis there already just speeds the whole process up and enables people to just enter and, and get trading and takes away that um, that important part but often time consuming part of the the whole process um, and i think that makes sites far more attractive to tenants yeah sure yeah i mean what strikes me on hearing this is that licenses in principle can really be viewed as a driver or at least a supporter, but, but, you know, often a driver of urban regeneration. Um, 
bars and restaurants have come under so much pressure during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so presumably licenses in principle can help new or returning operators to quickly start up their business, either for the first time or to restart it and sort of really play their part in, in kind of reviving the economy. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think so much of town and city centres ecosystems are underpinned by the hospitality sector, that the quicker that sector can get back on its feet, the quicker other things will fall into place. Um, I think that local authorities now are seeing the benefit of licensed premises as a driver of footfall. Um, and it, it's probably now a better, you know, a, as good a time as any to a, a get licenses in place ready for what we're seeing at the moment as a, you know, there's a huge pent up demand. I think there's going to be a real bounce back of the sector. It has, as you say, been hit unbelievably hard over the last 12 months, but I don't think that's dimmed demand at all. Um, so I think, yeah, we need now to start getting everything in place in order to facilitate that bounce back. Yeah, sure. Chris, presumably you'd agree with that, would you? And has it sort of helped as a developer to help your relationship with the council? They can really see how you're you're trying to help um, help in the regeneration drive, as it were. Yeah, it's just it's it's forward planning and being ready for as uh, you know as an efficient and healthy bounce back as possible. I mean, I just wondered whether at, at this stage it's worth bringing in the point on on outdoor seating felicity if that's relevant to the conversation in terms of we know last year how important it was in places like the northern quarter to have all of those outdoor seating areas and it's going to be play a role again this year i guess from april the 12th onwards is that something we can expand on from a licensing perspective yes i mean that is absolutely where we're seeing the activity at the moment from our clients uh, our operator clients um as the hospitality sector is unlocked, outdoor seating and alfresco dining is going to be the first thing that's allowed to happen. Um, and we've seen last year, you know, last summer, and again now, a real desire um, from local authorities to allow as much outdoor dining and alfresco dining as possible. So pavement licenses, for example, were a new piece of legislation that was brought in uh, at the end of last July, beginning of August, um, and were used to really good effect, um, particularly in Manchester, Liverpool, um, across the country. Um, a pavement license is a quick, easy, cheap, if not free, way of getting permission to put furniture on the highway by an operator to really sort of extend their space and allow them to trade outside at a point during the sort of the, the phased unlocking when they can't trade inside. Um, and that's been backed up by central government. So the, the pavement license regime was brought in just for a few months initially last year, but that's now been recently confirmed as being extended until next year. So that gives, um, I think, a boost to operators um, who perhaps don't have the benefit already of a, of a beer garden or a large outdoor space of their own. But by being able to go onto pavements or roads, because some roads are being closed, um, to allow for that, that, that's a real help. And then as part of that legislation with pavement licences was the relaxation off sales. So the, the two things very much go hand in hand, but it's all designed to get the hospitality sector up and running externally before they can get back up and running internally, hopefully in the next couple of months. Felicity, perhaps you can explain what you mean by off sales, just for any listeners who, who aren't aware of um, the legislation. Yes, I mean, most premises licences, um, you know, the, the, the typical, a typical premises licence for a bar um, would obviously include the provision of sale of alcohol for consumption on the premises but it wouldn't necessarily also include um, permission for consumption off the premises some do but not all of them so last summer the government uh, relaxed relaxed that um, provision so if an operator uh, or the holder uh, of a premises license has um, the ability to sell alcohol for consumption on the premises an automatic entitlement to allow uh, consumption off the premises. So that combined with the, the pavement license process allows for that consumption 
beyond the curtilage of a of a bar or restaurant. Um, so the, the two things had to happen really in tandem, but combined um, of being really um, welcomed, I think, by hospitality operators. We're certainly at the moment incredibly busy getting those pavement licences in place to allow people to trade. Right, OK. And Chris, you're, you're doing this at Brentwood, are you? Sort of looking at the wider kind of planned public realm of, of some of your schemes, are you? And, and trying to sort of get this get this in place. Yeah, I mean, it's somewhere like Hatch. We're fortunate enough to already be an outdoor venue and already be set up to, to make the most of the um, the earlier return next month. And the, we've got um, a site-wide license that covers all of the units and then the public realm within Hatch as well. Um, but then outdoor seating is really important. At, um, well, loads of places, but examples like University Green on Oxford Road and then also Circle Square. Um, they become an extension of the restaurant and um, actually add to the sort of the vibrancy of the whole scheme or development. Um, so wherever we can, we, we encourage it um, and try and make sure that we've got the flexibility built into the licenses that we've got um, so that when we transfer them over to the end user, they're, they're ready to go. You're listening to the Place Northwest podcast. The subplot is Place Northwest's new weekly supplement of stimulating analysis that adds a probing and incisive voice to our news coverage, getting behind the headlines and examining the issues affecting the industry, from politics and finance to market trends and more. Every stone turned, every angle explored, every Tuesday morning. Subscribe to the subplot for free at placenorthwest.co.uk forward slash subscribe. Felicity, does this does all of this mean that councils? I mean, it sounds like they're being a, a hugely more receptive to these applications for licensing licenses in principle than they perhaps sort of used to be. Um, can you give some examples of where sort of councils have maybe changed their tune and, and they were quite hot on or, or quite tough on licensing um, awards in the past, and they're sort of really kind of seeing the advantages now of this greater certainty? Yes, I think we've seen across the country. Um, a willingness or greater willingness from local authorities to try and encourage um, the hospitality sector to get back up and running. Um, Lots of towns and city centres in particular are subject to what are called punitive impact policies. I think every city, um, with the exception of Manchester, has one of those policies in place. Um, and lots of towns do as well. And the existence of one of those policies creates a presumption. It is a rebuttable presumption, so you can you can beat it, you can you know get over that hurdle, but it does create a presumption against the grant of any new licenses in a particular area. And they tend to be brought in for locations where the police, for example, deem an area to be at saturation point where there is already, you know too many incidents of crime and disorder or antisocial behaviour. And so a policy is brought in to make sure that those issues can't get any worse. Um, They've been in place up and down the country for many years. uh, But what we have seen really interestingly uh, over the last six months or so is a move away from them by some authorities, Uh, most notably in Liverpool. They had a cumulative impact policy or several rather, that covered various parts of the city centre. They've all been removed as of the beginning of this year. Um, Trafford Council had those policies covering sale and auction and town centres, but those two have been removed this year. And it just means that it's easier for operators uh, either to enter those areas and open up new premises or for existing operators perhaps to diversify Um, take on extra floor space or apply for later hours. Um, It's not to say that it's um, always guaranteed that you'd be able to open up a new bar in one of those locations, but that policy barrier has been removed. And I think that's because um, local authorities are realising that they put off good operators because it, it takes time to overcome that policy hurdle, it takes money to do that. There's no guarantee that you can. Um, And it also, in my view, you know, the existence of one of those policies doesn't actually improve an area. Often they're imposed once the problems are already there. So what often happens is that it 
fossilizes that area. So those operators which might be causing some of those issues which the police have concerns about remain in place and, and it creates a barrier to new entrants to the market who might be better, more responsible, might offer something slightly different. And because they're not allowed access to that location, things don't get any better. So I think we're expecting to see some other local authorities follow suit. Um, Bristol um, have done it um, and some others are thinking about it. Now, as I say, Manchester has never had one in its city centre because I think they've always taken the approach that market forces um, will pervade and um, it's up to demand and you know areas will grow more organically um, but as I say every other town and city centre does have one so it's interesting to see them now um, mm -hmm. falling away which is good from an operator's perspective. Yeah really interesting what about though um, if you if you do want to get rid of that operator or, <laughs> um, you know I, I mean does does having a license of principle make it any easier or harder than sort of any other process to do that or you know are there any other kind of unintended or sort of less obvious advantages or disadvantages of, of using this tool um, that, that you know developers of the industry in general should be aware of? Yeah I think Licenses and principle are primarily used by developers for onward transmission to an end user, but that doesn't necessarily have to follow. An application for a license could be applied for and granted to a developer, but that license could remain in their name. Um, it's possible to license one unit multiple times. So a developer could apply for a license and, and obtain one and hold it, but then still require their tenant to apply for their own license and operate under that. And that creates what we, we call a shadow license in effect, um, that's just in the background. Um, and if there were to be any issues um, further down the line, perhaps with a, a tenant who perhaps um, needed to be moved on, for example, um, then there remains a license in place that can be used far more quickly than um, the, the process of applying for a license by a new operator. Okay, Chris, uh, what uh, what do you think about the sort of shadow license thing? And you know, does that give? Have you sort of used that before at Bruntwood? Um, and and you know, does that give you sort of additional certainty? Well, I mean, the 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 closest application of that that, that I can see is where in our um, in our pioneer buildings, so the likes of one eleven Piccadilly block, um, Blackfriars House, and, and Union as well, where we've created the sort of ground floor hospitality spaces um, that are open to the public, but also provide amenity to um, the, the users, the customers in the building. Um, whether it's a shadow license or not, I'm not sure, but the kind of the approach we've taken is that because that ground floor shared space is going to be you know, part managed by us and our, our on-site team, and then part managed by the cafe operator that we, that we provide the space to, that um, we actually, Brentwood hold the license over that whole ground floor area because it can encompass other parts of the building like event space and, and co-working lounges. Um, so we hold the license, but we ask that the, um, the hospitality operator um, is actually the, um, the designated premises supervisor, the DPS, on that license. And so I don't know if that affords us the same flexibility, i.e. If, you know, if we were to change the cafe operator, for instance, then we retain the license, but the, uh, the DPS on that license changes aligned with whoever's operating the space, which sounds like a slightly different point to shadow licenses, um, but that's, that's what we've done. No, but it shows, doesn't it, the flexibility of this tool and everything. Um, I wonder, just um, so as we sort of approach the end of, uh, end of this podcast, um, as, as a developer, can you offer any kind of advice, you know, having used this tool and worked with Kites on, on rolling out across your schemes? Can you give any advice to other developers looking to use it? You know, what, what should they bear in mind, really? Uh, well, I think just in terms of the, the, the going back to the point on uh, local authorities being receptive to it, I think from our own experience, we've had really good engagement and success in recent years. And I'd, I'd probably put that down to the fact that, you know, the, the local authority wants to see developers take responsibility for the process and because because it sort of demonstrates that 
the licensing strategy forms part of a wider amenity strategy for that particular building or the area as a whole. And, you know, having having seen that it's been thought through um, and, and, and forms part of a wider plan, um, probably makes them feel like um, they've, they've got more control over the process. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so I think that's about all we've got time for. But Felicity, is there anything else that you'd like to um, sort of um, say to sort of sum up and, uh, you know, uh, any kind of any further advice um, to what Chris has given? Um, I, I think probably just to say that obviously with the COVID pandemic has been so devastating to the hospitality sector. Um, I think it's really it's it's got the potential to reset a lot of things, a lot of um, processes or perhaps the way in which um, licensing applications were dealt with in the past, I think will now change. And I think probably for the better. And I think the hospitality sector has got a real opportunity to be such a driver and um, key player in the regeneration of towns and city centres. So I think there's lots of tools um, available now to both operators and on the retail side um, and, and the landlord side to, to really think again about how licensing can be used to make sure that you know, areas are reactivated and that footfall is brought back so that um, towns and city centres can thrive again. Brilliant. OK, well, uh, thanks so much to both of you. You know, hopefully that's given uh, developers, landlords, operators and others in the industry a really good idea of how to use this clearly very helpful legal tool to their best advantage. Thanks for listening to this Place Northwest podcast brought to you in association with Kite Solicitors. To discuss your own licensing options with Felicity, please email felicitytulloch, T-U-L-L-O-C-H, at kites.com. For more information on Kites, please visit www.kites.com. Thank you.